I'm grateful for the opportunity to, uh, to, uh, to share some thoughts with you. Uh, I'm grateful to Patrick for the invitation, which he gave me some months ago now. And of course, I'm grateful to the uh, many, many thousands of students I have had over my 52 years of, of teaching, more than half a century. And uh, I must say that even as a teacher, my students have taught me infinitely more than I have taught them. And I don't mean to sound phony or self-effacing, but it's absolutely true. They've taught me a great deal about humor and humility. Uh, in humor, regard to humor, they have taught me uh, that the highest form of self-criticism, of, of course, is being able to laugh at oneself. And humility, I must admit, has come in a variety of packages. Uh, uh, after a, a, a lecture in early September, a couple of years ago, I'm cutting across the parking lot, and uh, a student hailed me, Professor Morganson, Professor Morganson, do you have a moment? Uh, I'd just like to tell you what a lecture that was. It was, just, it was amazing, yeah, your energy. Uh, and it's surprising for, for a man like you to have so much energy, because most people your age are waiting at home simply to die. <laughs> well, uh, there's an awkward silence, as you might imagine. Uh, as she mumbled something unintelligibly about, about it came out the wrong way, etc. But, but nonetheless, uh, it's a lesson that uh, comes often, I must admit. Um, but they've also taught me uh, uh, the remarkable necessity of, uh, of imagination. And I should have known because many people have have shown me over the years just how important imagination is. I was born in the, in the deep, so-called Great Depression, uh, bread lines, uh, overburdened soup kitchens, people selling pencils and, and apples for a nickel on the, on the, on the street corners, a, a very difficult time. I don't, I don't go back to those overwrought scenes uh, necessarily, but just to remind myself of a government that mounted work programs that put to work that vast and idle, unemployed population building bridges and uh, park and camp facilities and schools. It was quite remarkable. I think of Tommy Douglas, who, who could imagine and then had the grit to pursue the idea that the health of the people is the highest law. Difficult times, uh, but uh, life as a child was a life in the imagination. And uh, oh my, our most memorable, speaking of memorable experiences, were those when we could escape into air places that were unused and overgrown and silent. The wasteland, and oh, how we loved the wasteland life where no adult play leaders and no lime-lined uh, fields and no marked macadam just our imaginations so that we could reconfigure these, these mysterious terrains and, and how much in our adult reveries we, we, we regret that life that dragged us out of that wonderful wasteland. And in fact, I wonder if we deny people the wasteland life, I wonder if we aren't denying them the very wonder which energized us so profoundly. And during those days, I had uh, wonderful uh, early education teachers uh, who had vivid imaginations. Think of my second grade penmanship teacher, Miss Gorman. Uh, never once did she suggest I, uh, and Bobby, if you're a true sinistral, you can understand this. Never once did she argue that I should change from writing with my left hand to my right hand, which was, of course, the appropriate mode of scripture in those days. But never once did she suggest that. She just figured this little seven-year-old sinistral would find the right path and live a life fully. Oh, it was a struggle, though, as I dipped my pen in the inkwell and left-handed, of course, you, you smudge everything you've written and it was desperate. Desperate as I tried to make perfect ovals and <laughs> lines. But Miss Gorman, in her patience, 
Simply let me struggle to add a bit of grace to an essentially graceless pen in those days. I had a professor of modern literature who would occasionally sit cross-legged on the classroom table and, and again, his classroom was again the life of the imagination. And even though I may occasionally forget the constructs of the concepts precise, I will never forget his good-humored and, and gentle way of lecturing to us in a way that I could imagine he was lecturing only to me. And it was interesting that, that during that life of imagination in his class, when he touched our consciousness, you could almost feel the rippled rising of your imagination. Um, difficult times, unforgiving times in some ways, but uh, I think the imagination today has a more difficult time. We don't seem to devote our time to enlarge it the way we, uh, the way we used to. Um, for example, uh, I, I think on campus life, I've noticed over my many years that that campus life seems to be slightly more harried and perhaps uh, more joyless. University administrative officials have all kinds of difficulties coping with the bureaucratic complexities that the university requires today. I think administrative officials have found it difficult to ignore the allure and invasive nature of the profit motive I think that university administrative officials have found it very difficult to ignore the voices that insist that the university modify its noble mission and fit its goals to meet the urgencies of, uh, of commercial and, uh, and the technological voices we hear, that we should make a remarkable contribution to the global economic order. Uh, Perhaps this is why a recent survey of university students, five years after they have graduated, they could not remember the name of one professor who inspired them. My colleagues have night sweats about the intricacies of their latest grant proposal, being urged to contribute to the financial resources of the university, but all the while they worry a little about the diminished esteem attached to teaching as opposed to research. And what they miss most is the, the collegial, which has today been replaced by scientific principles of, of, of management. So there are particular worries. My colleagues are asked to contribute to the knowledge economy. And it's interesting when I hear a knowledge, I think of a, an exchange in 1929 between a young journalist and Albert Einstein. And the young journalist asked Einstein, what about the relative importance of imagination or knowledge? Einstein thought for a moment and then he said, well, both are necessary, of course. But uh, the imagination is more important than knowledge. Knowledge is always limited Imagination encircles the world. Another problem facing us today is that we emphasize intelligence in our small children rather than wonder or, or wisdom or the imagination. From 1980 forward, the IQ levels of our children has risen dramatically, six to ten points every generation. But while the IQs of our youngsters has been going up, tests of creativity scores have gone down, dramatically leveling off at about the sixth grade. The children are not being rewarded for the imagination or the creative enterprise, perhaps, as they were in the past. Now, remember, a child's curiosity is triggered by, hmm, I wonder, and then that wonder is followed by questions, and our estimates are that children ask questions of 50 to 100 times a day, and parents will complain to me about inquiry fatigue and wish that the questions would stop. Sadly, they do stop. 
Around the sixth grade, children stop asking questions. And it's interesting, at that time too, academic enthusiasm or enthusiasm for learning also seemed to peak at that time. I, uh, I appreciate the fact that, uh, that I've got a nice mic with great fidelity and all that and television cameras, etc. But I do worry about our, our, our passionate love affair with, uh, with electronic gadgetry and devices. Um, I have stood on the curb for half a century and watched the passing parade of, of, of technological refinements and electronic gadgetry, all promising to radically alter the classroom climate and make learning uh, in our youngsters much more efficient. I've seen stereoscopes and films and uh, videotapes and uh, uh, movie strips and uh, PowerPoints and clicker questions and uh, two things bother me. One, does, do these gadgets uh, add another degree of separation between the students and the teacher? I'm not sure, but I wonder. We already have many degrees of separation as my classes get larger and larger. Distraction is another worry for me. Is it possible that we're so distracted by the imagery that we can create that it will make that kind of face-to-face, -face, endless dialogue through which we glimpse the truth no longer necessary? Or more seriously, will the distractions of all of these images compromise that solitude or that meditative space which is so essential for the development of character and for an enlarged imagination. I, I only have questions. The, uh, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual to soon be published, sponsored by the American Psychiatric Association, will have in its appendix in its new classification system, Internet Use Disorder. And I find it interesting that those media giants, Google, Twitter and, uh, and uh, Facebook are now warning their own staff about incessant texting and tweeting and web surfing and instead are holding seminars on meditation and the reflective process. Um, I'm not surprised when IBM recently convened a meeting of important business leaders discussing future crises, the important crises, apparently the consensus was that business leaders today in North America face a crisis of creativity. Imagination or diminished ma imagination might even have implications for our mental health. Students are asked to think of as many blocks or frustrations that might deny them graduation from university. And then they're asked to focus on one of these possibilities that they might not get their degree and imagine a variety of solutions to this particular problem. Now, students, as you might imagine, could readily list a number of possibilities that might deny them graduation, but they had great difficulty imagining a variety of solutions to this particular problem. And what worries me most, those students least likely to think up a variety of solutions became depressed and even had, uh, had thoughts of suicide. Um, mental health uh, facilities and universities today report a 40 to 50% increase in student use of their facilities. 40% of elementary school students, secondary school students, and university students suffer from some form of mild or severe test anxiety, desperately finding that one correct answer. One third of university students suffer from panic attacks, and 12% of our university population are clinically depressed. I will never, never blame the victim. 
Never. Not as a clinical psychologist, that would be heretical. But I'm wondering, maybe a diminished imagination might be necessary or sufficient for depression. Depressed world is colorless and suffocatingly flat, whereas the imagination proffers a world of possibilities as well as many different paths of access to those particular possibilities. What I guess I worry most about a possibility of diminished imagination is, uh, is that uh, the imagination um, can lead to empathy or compassion. And, uh, and I think that the imagination is a kind of reflective morality, a powerful tool for goodness and, and social justice because the empathic imagination struggles to see the other fully, fully developed and mature and humanized, if you will. And if that's not uh, possible, I would worry very much about empathy and diminished imagination. Um, I think it is, uh, we're thinking of the uh, next hundred years, I would say that perhaps we should spend the next hundred years rekindling the imagination so that we can create a world that justifies our dreams, for example, the dreams of our imagination. And I think through rekindling the human imagination, we can, we can re-enchant the world and make sacred those people and our world, which is, really should remain safe and inviolate. I think through the imagination, we can infuse people with a vitality uh, particularly when people are dispirited. Years of teaching, sometimes I've felt a little bit of disappointment and dejection, but I've never, never been disappointed in the exquisite, wondrous possibilities of teaching. Teaching that is intense and full of character, and that if teaching, the metaphor for teaching is touching, I think what's important there is we touch people through love. And for me, the classroom, a caring climate in the classroom consists of three important aspects to this love. First of all, I love psychology, uh, warts, warts and all, but I love psychology. I love the inseparable processes of teaching and learning. And of course, I have a deep and enduring love, love for my students. Um, one of my daughters sent me a recent colored print. And the colored print, highly stylized art, shows a person sitting on a boulder holding a lance with a dragon just off in the distance. And the caption is what arrested my thought. The caption reads, anyone can slay a dragon. But to wake up each morning and to come to love the world all over again, that is a hero. And I know heroic colleagues and heroic students who get up in the morning and walk into class and come to love that world all over again. And I know why. The challenge is inescapable and, and of course, beautiful. Plato said many years ago, the student is a light, a creative spark waiting to be of use in dispelling the darkness. And of course, we're as concerned with the darkness in here as we are with the darkness out there. And as I look back over my long pilgrimage, this journey to the beautiful city of light, as I reflect on it, all I can say to myself is that even though my part, my, my bit part that I've played in this immense drama has certainly has been and is enough to fill my heart with joy. Thank you.